And here we go. Welcome everybody. If you're just uh, joining us, we just opened up the uh, the room. So glad to have you all with us today. We're just uh, going to let people gather and um, as, as these Zooms are, people are just kind of joining. There's obviously always a few fun little technical issues going on. So uh, I'm excited. I'm, I'm down in Elliott's studio here in New York City. Elliot was just in the room, just uh, going over some files with us, which was exciting. And um, my business partner, Andrea there, he's out in uh, beautiful Denver, Colorado. And my good friend, Rick Smolin, coming up with a, a great podium for his laptop. Yeah, so. Coming to us from, from uh, beautiful and chilly Long Island. Yeah, a little chilly here. Yeah. But, Please uh, let us know where you're joining us from. You can just put it right in the chat. It's always nice to see where everybody is zooming in from. Yeah. Gloucester. Hi, Zar. <laughs> Florence, Italy. Terrific. Nebraska. Montgomery, Alabama. Philly. Rhode Island. Cape Hatteras. L.A. Newton. Minneapolis. People Texas. From all over. Iowa. Wisconsin, Door County, uh, Washington, Renton, <laughs> UK, uh, yeah, um, Montreal, yeah. and other Philly, Somerville, my old home. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to um, tell people a little bit about today as we're just getting getting ready to get started here that. Um, we're going to show you a brief uh, video that we put together about the system that you're that we're going to be talking about today, our new instant image uh, archive service. And um, and then I'm going to introduce uh, Rick Smolin, who's here with us today. And um, but really the our hope out of today is that um, after watching the video and I'm sure some of you may have seen some of our other webinars that we've done that are on our uh, posted all posted to our YouTube channel. Um, as this one will be, is that you, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to know what questions you have about the service, about the system. I've got Scott Niedermeyer here with me from, uh, who's going to be running our new on-site image archive service. So we can talk a little bit about that as well. So, um, yeah, so what I'd like to do here in just a minute or so is we're going to show our, our little brief video. And um, so, you know, Get out a pencil and paper if you want, a cup of coffee, wherever you are, and um, write down some questions. Uh, um, let us know. We really want to hear from you. We're here to answer any questions you might have about what we're doing. So, um, And if you do have a question, you can always go to the bottom of your screen and click on the Q&A and enter the question there, and we'll be going through that Q&A as well. So, um, And I'm going to be manning the chat. So. Uh, if there's a question that comes up in the chat, um, I'll try to answer all questions that come up um, as we're talking, or I will answer them in the Q&A. So if you have a question you want to ask Rick specifically, please use the Q&A. And just general questions, um, put them in the Q&A too, and I guess I'll answer for them there as well. So, All right. So here comes our little video. Uh, so sit back, and uh, we'll get this going for you. We good, Andrea? Um, yeah, did you want You just muted yourself, Andrea. Do you want to introduce everybody, Eric, first before you start the video? Just so we, you know, let people know who, who you are and who I am. And... Oh, sure. We'll do that. So uh, thanks, Andrea. So my yeah, name's Eric. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm Eric Luden. Um, I am the founder and uh, owner of Digital Silver Imaging up in Belmont, Massachusetts. We started in uh, 2008 sort of specializing in our black and white silver gelatin process. And uh, 2010, Andrea uh, became a business partner in the business and we expanded into a bunch of other services and um, you know, into the color, fine art printing, mounting, matting, framing. Um, we've really had the privilege of working with some really extraordinary clients over that time. Um, you know, and our passion really is about printing, help, helping people get files off their computers and 
you know, whether it's on their own wall or the wall of a gallery or a wall of a friend's house, the, 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 we always feel that the, the image isn't finished until it's printed and hanging on the wall. So um, that's who I am. And then my business partner, Andrea Zaki, is above me, as I just mentioned. Andre has been with us for, uh, been with me for 11 years. He's like my big brother in guiding light. So I always appreciate his, his calm advice and, and all that in the, in the process. And I'm just going to spin my computer for a second and show you Scott Niedermeyer, who's over here. Can you, can everybody see Scott? He's part of our new, he's new, newest member of our team, hailing all the way from Houston, Texas. And, um, and then my friend Rick Smolin been a really great friend. We've been working together for a number of years and um, Rick's going to be with us to talk a little bit about the service um, and his great experience and kind of introduction to really helping us to find a service and, and uh, you know, having acquired the equipment and, and why we did it. So um, I'm going to jump into the video here, which will take you through the whole, the whole system and give you a good overview. Um, so Andrea, can, every, can you see my screen with the video? All right, here Digital we go. Digital Silver Imaging, Instant Image Archive Service. The value of your archive of film, prints, and related documents depends directly on the quality, flexibility, and accessibility of that archive. Digital Silver Imaging's Instant Image Archive Service delivers drum scan quality digitization at a very affordable price. Our service can handle any film format, as well as flat prints and artwork, up to 20 by 24 inches. Your film is loaded into precision-made metal holders. No oil or fluid mounting is required. At the heart of the instant image capture service is a Phase 1 digital camera. The Phase 1 produces a best-in-class 150 megapixel capture, but high resolution isn't the whole story. Our system uses specially designed flat field lenses and a series of extension tubes for proper magnification and consistent edge-to-edge -edge sharpness. Once the appropriate lens is mounted, the system is laser aligned to ensure that the image sensor is parallel to the precision machined base. Lens cast calibration is used to guarantee even lighting with every lens and extension tube combination. The lighting we use is rated at 98 out of 100 points on the color quality index and our touchless negative holders and archival practices make our instant image capture service compliant with the Library of Congress's VAGI guidelines. This is a claim that cannot be made by drum scanning or other legacy digitization method. Amazing digital hardware needs equally amazing software and skilled technicians to process the digital files. To accomplish this task, we use the Capture One Cultural Heritage Software application. A significant obstacle in the digitization process of color materials such as Kodachrome and C41 negatives is the conversion. These processes require specialized knowledge, a practical hand, and a large array of custom-built profiles. We bring knowledge and experience to creating superior digital captures of all film types, photographs, and flat artwork. Our philosophy is that every client's needs are different we craft a solution to meet those needs. Our instant image capture service is ideal for photographic prints and flat artwork up to 20 by 24 inches. We start with a custom color profile for each piece of artwork using an X-Rite color target. When large files, color accuracy, and 16-bit reproduction are required, our service is unmatched. Instant color capture service is fast and affordably priced, consistently lower than most quality art reproduction services. Once digitized, we can also make fine art inkjet prints, 
also known as Giclée prints. At Digital Silver Imaging, we can also mount, map, and frame your fine art reproduction. To discuss your digitization needs, please contact us at info at digitalsilverimaging.com or by phone at 617-489-0035. Digital Silver Imaging, Fine Art Printers, Mounting, Matting and Framing Services, Digitization, and Print Delivery Worldwide. Digital Silver Imaging, the fine art of printing in a digital world. So that's our, uh, our new video that we just finished producing up in Boston. I want to thank my friend uh, Andy Ryan from Boston who uh, helped us put together that video. He did, really did a great job. So um, I want to switch my camera here. I, I want to, because I'm really, as I said, we're very excited to be where we are. We're back in Elliot Irwin's studio in New York. And uh, so I'm just going to give you a quick little kind of a tour of where we are. It's kind of fun to be in a master's studio here. Um, you know, a lot of history, a lot of great images and boxes and boxes of prints and, and other really cool things of where we are. Um, and it's really fun to be kind of looking at this. Uh, there's our system here at Elliott's and then the uh, famous Muhammad Ali photograph up there on the on the wall. So you went out of focus there, Eric. For uh, I don't know if it's going to refocus. Sorry. Did it refocus? The de demo gods at work here. Yeah, yeah, it's still out of focus. All right. Well, we'll go back. To it's the a feature. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to go back to the other camera here. So anyway, um, it, as I said, it's it were you know it was really fun that uh, Elliot was in just a few moments ago looking at stuff. He he couldn't stick around, but you know I'm really excited uh, to be here, and I I, I really owe uh, this honor to Rick, who um, I met I think in 2014, if I'm right, Rick. You were working on uh, the movie and the book tracks. And uh, our good friend Doug Menuey connected I, us. Yeah. Who I, mm. So I owe a lot of gratitude to Doug for that great mm. introduction. And um, and you know, so we've done some fun projects with Rick uh, over the years. But uh, Rick approached me, and I'm going to let him sort of tell you the story um, that he needed to do some work for his father-in-law's archive. So um, Rick, you want to tell him kind of how you and I came back together about this project? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thanks, Eric and Andrea. Nice to be with you guys today. Um, uh, you know, my dad gave me a book of Elliot's photographs when I was 16, and I didn't know what being a photographer meant, but I just told my dad, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And he said, you know, you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. You're not going to be a photographer. That's not a, a real profession. You're going to, I don't want you doing weddings and baby portraits. Um, but I, I was, the moment I saw Elliot's work the first time, I, I didn't, I, I'd never seen pictures like that before. And I loved his sense of humor. Uh, what I liked about Elliot's pictures so much was that he wasn't making fun of people, but the pictures were very funny. Um, it was a gentle look at, at sort of humanity and all of its foibles. Um, and what's remarkable is Elliot actually has a new book coming out. Elliot is 92, I think now. And uh, he's, he's been doing a book almost every year for the last, I don't know, 15 years. And so at 92, he just went through all of uh, the boxes you see around behind you there, and he has a book uh, coming out, um, sorry, um, call it called Found Not Lost, um, that is um, um, all pictures that um, have never been published before. So, um, uh, you know, we, we, excuse me a second. Um, um, sorry, I keep getting phone calls here. Um, we thought that it would be, uh, because Elliot's negatives um, span 70 years, we thought it would be really prudent to, uh, to digitize all of his sort of greatest hits. And we were looking for a way to do that. And uh, Elliot and his uh, studio manager, Mio, had been using the Imacromp system for many years. And Imacromp, I think, is 15 years old now. Um, it's not being, I don't think it's being supported by Hasselblad anymore. Uh, the technology takes seven minutes to scan each photograph. It's very painstaking um, and it's very time consuming. And so I was looking for, uh, see if there was any systems out there that could actually streamline the process because we figured that um, Elliot has brought 
about 3,000 pictures, uh, uh, slides, ne sorry, negatives that we'd want to scan. So in the course of doing some research, I heard about this technology. It was like a $90,000 scanner uh, that the Library of Congress uses, really high-end system. And uh, obviously we couldn't afford to buy a $90,000 scanner, but um, I thought of Eric and Andrea and digital silver imaging because um, I've always felt like their whole purpose sort of uh, for existence is to actually showcase uh, photographers' work and to make it look as good as possible. So I reached out to uh, Digital Silver Imaging, and Eric came to New York, and uh, Eric and Mio and I went to together to look at this system, and we were just blown away. Uh, the speed was so incredibly fast, the quality was extraordinary, and then of course when we found out that all these other institutions like the Library of Congress was using this technology, we thought, well, this is a great solution. The dilemma is that um, uh, I think Mio and I were very reluctant to have Elliot's negatives leave his studio. Uh, you know, my nightmare is always that you ship something, whether it's FedEx or whatever, and that somehow, you know, the negatives get lost. Um, and these are, you know, so important. So um, in the course of talking to Eric about the possibility of digital silver imaging acquiring one of these very expensive systems, um, we talked about the idea of sort of a white glove service where Eric and his team, Scott now in this case, would actually come to Elliot's studio and basically move in. And so the negatives would never leave the studio. And the more we brainstormed this, the more we started thinking, you know, there might be other photographers out there who likewise have these incredibly valuable negatives or slides or prints that they need scanned, but they don't want it leaving the office. And so this whole idea of bringing the scanner to the photographer studio seemed like a great idea. Uh, I think all of us were kind of stunned that it almost got to be too many photographers actually wanted this service. So I believe that now you guys, uh, Andrea, you guys have bought two of these now, right? You have two systems set up? Yeah, so we have, uh, we have the one that's in your studio actually is our second setup and it's gonna go eventually in the van that we're custom building. So, and, and we can talk a little bit about that later, but yeah. Right, is your service right now only on the East Coast? Is that correct? Um, well, uh, hopefully at the moment it is only on the East coast, but we, the van should be done here, uh, in the week. So, um, then Scott, you can always contact Scott and, and he can arrange to go pretty much wherever you are. We plan on, you know, kind of doing a tour of the United States. So, you know, right. right. <laughs> so I, I, I think, you know, one of the things that was very apparent is that, um, I think every, uh, photographer needs a Mio Nakamura who, as I said, runs Elliot's uh, studio <laughs> because the pre-organization necessary in order for Scott to efficiently scan 3,000 negatives over a sh very short period of time means that, that someone's got to get all those negatives, you know, because they were pulled from 70 years of work, tens of thousands of rolls of film. So Mio had to basically organize and make sure that all those negatives were pulled, that they were identified, that they were, you know, no, because part of it is also the metadata that goes into every one of those scans. So it was really a, a very, um, the system you guys have is, is great, but you have to make sure that, that the photographer and his assistants uh, have all these elements in place uh, to make sure that, this, that it all goes very smoothly. So, um, um, you know, I think Mia should write like his own little handbook of what needs to happen in advance definitely, to definitely. get ready for your team to move in. Yeah, we should get Mio to do a, at the very minimum, a blog post for us. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But having having somebody super organized is essential to making this all go smoothly. Mm -hmm. And then and then um, as as the video explained, it's not only scanning the software, not only scanning the negatives, but then there's a, a post process of turning those scanned images uh, back into something that the studio can then use. The, the the reason I first actually started working with digital silver imaging is I was fascinated by this idea that you guys have the ability to um, take digital files and print them on silver halide paper. So you sort of had the best of both worlds. You can do all the Photoshop manipulation you want after scanning the negatives. But then when you want to make a print, you, you've got this wonderful silver halide paper. Um, so um, that, that's one of the things that brought me to you guys in the first place. And I think it's a very unusual set of, of, uh, of skills and um, uh, talents and um, products that digital silver imaging offers that I think is unlike any other uh, lab in the country at this point. Well, thank you. And, and, you know, I think I was listening, uh, Rick, you had mentioned something about, you know, there was like something like 3,500 uh, captures, right, that we did here for Elliot. But yeah. also, too, I think one of the really great things about the system 
is that, you know, if you have like, let's say, you know, our technician, Scott, um, if he's there capturing images for you, you know, you could be, if you're the photographer, you could be literally be sitting at another monitor. And as Scott is capturing, you could be reviewing those images and, you know, typing in metadata or entering captions or whatever you wanted to do. And I think that's yeah. a real strength of our system as opposed to like, you know, something like not to knock it, it's a great, it's a great piece of equipment like the Imicon, where, you know, you have that six, seven minutes or however long it's taking to scan the image. And then you're just kind of waiting and then you have to do your post. And uh, the nice thing about, about our system is that it's an integrated system. It's like, you know, from start to finish, it's one smooth workflow. And um, because I know too that isn't, and correct me if I'm wrong, cause I wasn't there in New York during the capture, but um, sometimes you need to make changes, even as organized as Mio was, there'd be a negative that, you know, might not be in the best of shape or, you know, you might need to make adjustments. So that's also kind of really makes the process go quickly and streamline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I was amazed given that Elliot was sort of the guinea pig or his negatives were um, how smoothly it went the first time. And now you guys have this down to a science, which is uh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess the fact that you actually, that it was so successful, you actually bought a second $90,000 scanner uh, speaks to the demand and uh, the success of how fast, you know, how quickly people are, are jumping on this. I know that you've got other photographers like Jay Maisel and uh, um, Stephen Wilkes, and um, I think Steve McCurry's been looking at it. The, the, you know, some of the, the greatest living photographers uh, in America right now are all looking at the system as a way of preserving their, uh, you know, historic and important work. So testament to you guys. Oh, thanks, Greg. And I know uh, we really appreciate you being on, Rick, and I know that you need to jump off here in a little bit. So. Um, if in the next few minutes you have specific questions that you, you might want oh, yeah. Rick to address, um, we can you can type them into the Q and A if, if if there's anything specific for Rick. Um, but I will tell you kind of what you know what you know what really made this go so smoothly as we said was the uh, was the organization. I'm just going to switch cameras here again, and um, Scott can. Uh, so Scott's over there, so um, you can kind of see the. Uh, the boxes um, that Mio laid out, which he really did an amazing job with. If you want to just pull one out and just show us some of those, Scott, it's just, you know, the organization is, you know, is really great. And obviously this is a, you know, this is a, is a very large collection. Um, but, you know, we, we, I also don't want people to be scared away that says, oh, I'm not an Elliot or, or I'm not a Steve McCurry or a James Knockway or a Rick Smolin, but, you know, you may have, uh, you know, if, if you're somebody who shot film, um, this, ser this service can be very affordable and what you're getting is the absolute best resolution possible of any system out there and um, be able to then organize your, you know, if it's 50 negatives, it's 100 negatives, if it's, you know, 5,000 negatives, um, you, you know, we, we have ways of working with you either wh whether the film gets shipped to us in a, in a secure box to our Belmont location or, you know, if you're in a major city and we, we coordinate getting to that city with Scott and our van, but, you know, I mean, the, the organization again, that, you know, is, I think that's the one thing we're finding is probably the most um, important part of this process is your organization and just pulling your, mm -hmm. your work together. So the beauty of the way this was set up is Mio has everything labeled according to column and box. Um, and you can see, you know, our labels here on the boxes. And then everything was created into a spreadsheet, which then went into a Google Docs that was shared. And then I also had um, PDFs with thumbnails. I don't know if you kind of kind of see that. So I had the thumbnails, and so I had this in both paper format, so I could sit here and check off as I was going. And I had everything in digital format on a spreadsheet uh, via the Google Docs. So as I was going through, the big part of this collection and what we were working with is the the numeric. Um, the naming and the, and the numeric structure had to be very precise because it's already been, you know, documented over the course of, of his, you know, Elliot in his career. And we, we wanted to maintain that. And so with the spreadsheet that Mio created, what I would do is I would literally copy and paste from the spreadsheet into Capture One Cultural Heritage. Uh, we'd make a capture on the file, look at it on the computer, ensure that it was in focus, ensure that, you know, there was no um, dust or hair or fuzz on it. I use a bubble duster because no canned air, just bubble duster. 
get it nice and clean. And then when it was crisp, you know, ensure that it had the correct name. And then we move you know, on to the next file. The, you know, doing the naming structure and the metadata is one of those things that slows you down a little bit. Um, having it be really organized for you, walking into this situation, like I couldn't have been more fortunate that everything was just super clean. If I ever had a question, I not only had the spreadsheet to look at, but I also had the thumbnails to look at. And so it was just a, it was just a really great workflow. It was a, it was a privilege. And then, you know, as Rick mentioned earlier, the, um, when Scott and I were really in a groove, we, we were averaging 60 to 65 negatives an hour. So the speed is really, um, is really amazing with this and that the file resolution from this compared to an Imicon it, it, it is it's better than an Imicon. It rivals drum scanning and, um, you know, our cost structure for this because it's so much faster, um, is about a 10th the cost in, in some cases of what you would pay for a good quality drum scan today. And you're not having to actually coat the negative in oil and touch the negative the way you do with drum scans. Absolutely. So it's much more safer for a, 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 a much reduced harm, potential harm to, to the negative or slide. Yep, absolutely. We're using two negative carriers. One of them I don't have out right now. It's literally a, a rigid base. Um, I want to call it a soft metallic base. It's made out of a aircraft aluminum that has a coating on it um, so that there's no, there's no burrs or rough edges. It's very, it's like we're going to call a soft metal, if you will. Um, and then a magnet, it literally clamshells in that magnet. So it's very easy, it's very clean, it opens up. It, the only contact that's happening with the film is just on those edges, on those sprockets. Uh, the rest is sitting in the magnet. And then we have a, a sure. new system. Um, you know, again, it's made by phase one as well, and it has little clamps on the side. So right here, the film goes in there. You can and walk it, up closer. Actually. Walk up closer. Yeah. It's literally um, a little contact holder that just clamps the edge of the film again keeping it contactless so that we're not causing any um, damage to the film. We're not risking any damage to the film. And that's really key with this system is that with a wet mount, with a drum scan, you know, with some of the other systems on the market, um, when you put it in the carrier, it bends the film significantly with a drum scan. It's using that wet mount. It's using that mounting fluid to mount it to that SC tub. And it just, it's something that A, can risk damaging the film and B, can just create a mess. And this is just, it's super clean and, and super just, um, What's the word I'm, I want? To, I, I have lint free in my head, but dust is my enemy. So I continually, I, I, I sleep with a bubble duster at night. Like this is my best friend. Um, we spend yeah. a lot of time together. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. Um, but that is, that is a big, that is a big advantage of the system um, is, is that speed and accuracy contact, you know, uh, scanning. So we're, we're really grateful for that part. Um, I, yeah. I also want to chime in here and say that, um, you know, Mio has done a, a, an amazing job, but I don't want it to sound like, I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good here <laughs> in saying that, um, you know, if you do have, if you do have an archive and you need it, uh, and you need it digitized, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Your organization doesn't have to be perfect. It helps get more done in a certain amount of time, but, but uh, it's better to start on it as opposed to just kind of keep pushing it off and pushing it off because you know what, we can always come back. So, um, you know, we're not going anywhere. So. And there was a question in there, which I think relate, you know, again, was helpful for um, Mio and Rick is that some, and somebody posted a question about this, about how will the files be read in the future? So the, one of the great things about the capture one software is that the, the file is a, um, is a, you know, a phase capture one IQ file. But when we export out the job, we can export them as TIFFs. We can give you the raw file, which can be read in uh, Lightroom or capture one. Obviously capture one gives you much more, more control, but, um, but if working with the raw file, but you know, one of the advantages to, uh, you know, to Rick and Mio was that we can also give you full resolution TIFFs. So uh, to answer that question about mm -hmm. how these files be read in the future, there, you can read them with uh, Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One. Um, so we're starting to get some some technical questions in, but I want to know is if anyone had a, a specific question for Rick. I'm going to actually ask, ask Rick a question because uh, Rick, I think, is a photo visionary just as much as he's really a great photographer. Um, so. Uh, Rick, you know, you chose this system basically 
And, you know, kind of apropos to that question about um, file formats is how is Elliot storing his archive and how are you storing your archive and, and moving forward in the future? Well, I mean, you know, I had a friend who lived in uh, Berkeley, California, uh, an old life magazine photographer and uh, in the fires there, I guess it was maybe 10, 15 years ago, he lost his entire um, collection, all of his work, all of his negatives were destroyed. And it was just absolutely heartbreaking. He had not backed them up. He didn't have scans. And obviously the technology today is so much better than it was 15 years ago. But, um, you know, the, the first thing I always say to every photographer is you do not want everything in one place. Um, and, and the ability now to have uh, basically digital negatives, I mean, copies that are identical to the original negatives or slides um, in more than one location, hopefully in three locations. I know some photographers are incredible. I think Steve McCurry, I think he told me once that he actually has three physical locations in different you know, places around the United States. So that if there's an earthquake or fire or theft or whatever, um, he's always got backups of the material. Um, I'm not an expert in any of this. I mean, this is really your area of expertise. Um, and, you know, inevitably, the moment you finish scanning everything, you think, oh, there's going to be a new technology. <laughs> what, what I like about this scanner is I feel like it's kind of like it's future proof. You know, the file formats can change, but the, the, the sheer, uh, the digital resolution of these scans is so extraordinary. Uh, and the fact that you can literally do, you know, billboards in Times Square now with these, with these scans. Uh, gives me a, a great sense of comfort knowing that Elliot's work will be preserved for him and for his heirs. And, uh, and then any photographer that wants to make sure that their uh, families in the future have access to this. I know a lot of photographers are looking for a way to have their work preserved in, uh, you know, in institutions, at universities, in, uh, in places like the Ransom Center or the University of Arizona. There's a number of places now around the country that are starting to amass these collections of important historical images. Uh, obviously, they want the best possible um, scans. The other thing is that once it's digital, it's so much more accessible. I mean, I know personally when it, someone someone calls me and says, "Can you get me a picture you shot in you know 1975 of Dennis Banks in front of you know Mount Rushmore?" You got to find the negative. I mean, it's so time consuming, and and the ability. You know, someone said to me that you know if you don't have keywords w w attached to your pictures, that it's like they don't even exist. So uh, the accessibility. The digitalization brings it makes it actually more much more useful than the actual negatives and now that you actually have the quality that's equivalent to the negative it's the best of both worlds yeah yeah it, it, yeah just not to sound like an old fogey but it just kind of reinforces how great and how much work those old-fashioned stock agencies used to do back in the day you know when people used to request images not digitally but you know via a, a phone call so yeah. 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 Um, so, Eric, do you have any other questions for Rick? We're getting a lot of tech questions. I'm going yeah. through here to see if yeah, I... I can, I can answer those. And uh, but Rick, I really appreciate your joining us today and, and uh, participating in our call. And um, sure. again, your, your, you know, your curiosity, you know, led us to be the, really one of the very first photo labs in the country to buy one of these systems. I mean, this system is in place in multiple institutions. But as a photo lab, to have invested not in one but two systems, I think is yeah. unheard of at this point. And uh, you know, without your kind of, uh, you're like a dog with a bone, Rick. You you get on, <laughs> you get on to something, and uh, I just love the tenacity. And you just you go at stuff, and you you find it. And um, you know, it literally, if you remember, it was literally March of just as the pandemic was hitting. It's like a know, week before the world shut down, right? Yeah that I was able to come to New York and uh, and to see you and to go over and, and look at this equipment. So, um, you know, again, my great appreciation to you and for the, you know, the many, the many people that you've connected us with who are so excited about this service. So I really well, thank you. Thank you for doing such a good job. I wouldn't have not introduced you to all these people if I didn't, you know, have an incredible amount of respect uh, and belief in what you guys are doing. So it's, uh, it's fun, you know, when it, this is good for everybody, it, it works on both sides so well. So, All right. Well, thank, thank you, you guys. All right. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Enjoy the island. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Take yeah. care. Bye, Rick. So, so Eric, um, I think a big question we're getting from, well, from a lot of people, from excellent Boston photographer, Steve Dunwell, and Kenneth asks, 
And I think there was someone else. A lot of people are asking about, about slides. slides in cardboard mounts. Yep. Um, so let's let's talk about that. Yeah. So, so the sys, you know, obviously, um, you know, for those of you who didn't shoot a lot of transparency film, when they were mounted into cardboard slides or plastic mounts, you lose about fifteen percent of the image. So I do know that some photographers then shot kind of with that knowledge. But we, you know, if you're trying to frame everything um, full frame, you're losing part of that image once it gets put into a mount. So um, if if the, you know, like if you go get something uh, drum scanned, obviously they have to remove things from the mount. So we do have a holder that will scan these things right inside of their mount. Um, if you need the whole image and the sprockets, then yes, those are going to have to be. Uh, opened up, but Scott just got out the um, the holder for the uh, for slides, so you can see that you know it, it it does do them, you know, with you just sort of slide the the uh, mounted slide in. But um, you know, and I see from Gerd and other people who are asking about how how that works. If if you want the whole image, then um, they are going to have to be unmounted, which can be done by us, and we and we 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 can do that. We just have to charge you for that, and um, but if, if that if that's what you just we said in the in the video, if it's something you you want done, we will do it. But if you also need the mount captured as well, we can capture the entire slide with the mount in there too. Because I know a lot of people have a lot of info on the mounts. Yep. Yeah. If you wrote, if you'd use that slide scribe software or anything else and put labels on there, that is another nice thing about this system is that you have the transmissive light coming from underneath the system. But um, there's also a uh, photon uh, in there, and um, the photon lights, which are next to Scott there, you can see up on that side. Um, one of them on. And so obviously it's a big bright light, but you can turn that off now. But uh, so that means that with that on, we can actually do both transmissive light and reflective off the surface of the uh, off the surface of the. Um, mount. So if, as Andrea said, if you have a bunch of data on there in terms of when it was shot, the title, maybe what magazine it appeared in, you can get both the, the quality of the, of the film itself plus the, uh, plus the, air, uh, the, the lettering. Yeah. So um, Gerd asked, um, drum scanning shows the full frame, but uh, re-photographing slash scanning in a mount cuts out the portion of the image. What solution do you have for that? And I think you address that partially by saying that we we will take the the transparency out of the mount, uh, but maybe uh, you might want to talk about the way we actually hold the film, which is I want to emphasize why it meets the FAGI standards, the Library of Congress standards, because it's actually uh, the only really acceptable archival way to handle film. Whereas a drum scanner, you use oil or a liquid solution on the film and uh, the chances of damaging your film are greatly increased. Um, so maybe, though, Scott, you can talk about how that that how our holder holds those slides. So the, we have the two types of holders. The, the one is, like I said, it's a, mag, it's a magnet. Um, it's, a, it's a big magnet on that rigid base. So for full frame slides, there has to be some way of holding it. Um, you know, realistically, in, in, in order for it to work within the system here, if it's a situation where you want it all. Like I want to see the edge of the film to the edge of the film. We actually use a, a specially created Annie Newton glass carrier. Um, and I can just um, float that in between the Annie Newton glass carrier and capture like the entire piece of film. That can be done. Uh, it's it's a lot more labor intensive just because of it's an eight by 10 glass carrier getting it in position and getting it out of the lens. Whereas, you know, our slide carriers here are very efficient because once they're loaded up, I can just go through the system, click one, click two, click three, click four. Um, if you have chromes, the 35 chromes, we can remove them from that carrier and put it in our standard film holder, which again is only capturing, you know, it's only clamping down on the edge of the film. So it's, a, it's relatively contactless and you're still seeing sprocket to sprocket. That's the big thing that everybody wants is they want to see those film sprockets and, and those black frames on the edges in between the, in between the frames of film. And we give you that, that whole capture. We're not going to go in and crop or anything like that. When, when I deliver a file, it has the sprockets on both the top and the bottom, as well as any black material on the edges, so that you can then take that into Photoshop 
and mm. crop it to you know your desired effect and the vision that you had for that image when you created it. Great. So I have another question here, and I'm going to throw this out there. Maybe you guys might want to cogitate on this. So Anonymous asks, um, can you provide a rough idea of the unit cost for scanning 1,035 negatives on separate strips? Yep. Um, it's going to come down to... Um, well, if we're coming to you, that we, there's some transportation costs. If you get them to digital silver imaging um, at about a thousand, uh, they're about fifteen dollars a capture at that price. And another part of that question is they wanted to know the pixel count um, of a thousand two hundred and eighty by ten thousand six hundred four. <laughs> Can you say that again? Okay, so maybe you could maybe you could repeat that, Scott. <laughs> 14,280 by 10,604. Okay. And because our system captures everything at, uh, at what? 151 megapixels. 151 the megapixels. The black and white, uh, the black and white 35s here, that's the, that's the pixel count on the 35. You know, of course, everything is a little bit different depending on what it is, but that's for the 35 film. Uh, and with the black and white NIGs that we've been working on here at Elliot's full 16 bit TIFF, um, output is right around 800 um, megabytes. Okay, great. And uh, a lot of people have been asking, can we do black and white negatives? And absolutely, yes, that's absolutely, yeah. And yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. That no, the, the, that's the that's the beauty of the we utilize a special version of Capture One Pro called Cultural Heritage, and Cultural Heritage was designed specifically for dealing with this type of material. And there are features built into the software that don't exist in regular Capture One Pro, uh, such as um, specific film uh, profiles. So film standard, film negative, film positive, as well as ICC profiles that go along with the kind of different, the different film bases, whether it's a chrome or a negative or, and whatnot like that. So all of that is built into Capture One, which is one of those additional tools that really makes this a wonderful system. And um, Greg asked, how do I get the images back uh, if I use your service? Disk, thumb drive, something tangible, question mark? We have um, many different ways of delivering. Um, traditionally, we've been handing out you know, a, a jump drive um, that can be delivered. A lot of times people ask for uh, just retransfer and we can retransfer the files to you. So you just, you click the link and download them to your computer. If it's a larger job, um, like this one that I, that I worked on here with Elliot, uh, I went out and just purchased a, a hard drive, a Samsung T5, um, and that will get handed off um, to you at the end of the job. You know, could somebody a, buy their own hard drive and send it to us like that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, if you 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 can yeah. send a you can send a hard drive in with your files, and we can drop it on that and then send it back. Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on on how many files it is that we're capturing. Because if we're you know if we're doing five or ten frames, you know, a WeTransfer is an easy thing. Like we upload it to the WeTransfer, you click the link and you get an email. It downloads to your computer and then you back it up and you archive it at home on your system. If it's a if it's a big job, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 uh, files, realistically, a hard drive is the best way to deliver those files to you. Okay, I've got a really good question here from Emily. And uh, she asks, uh, how does it handle focus if your negs are 50 years old with some warp? Scott, I know you can answer this question. Yeah, I can answer this question. That's actually one of the challenges that we ran into um, here at Elliott's, and this is something that I've I've been working on. Uh, the earlier film, and especially a lot of film that you know earlier versions of Fix um, have hardener in it. For my you know my film people out there, and as that hardener gets older, it it dehydrates even more, and the film dehydrates, and it starts to pull those sprockets in on themselves, and so we get this really kind of brittle springy film and that was one of the challenges that we were facing the first time around is for this older film from the from the 40s and 50s that had that really um curvy curve to it and even though i put it in the magnet holder it still had enough flex in it to to throw it out of focus the solution uh with a little bit of homework and research that we found uh was this this phase one uh carrier right here and like i said it has clamps on both sides and so i literally i'll load the film emulsion side up so it sits there, it's opposite the curve, um, and then it just really gently clamps down on either side of those sprockets to hold the film perfectly flat. 
that's one of the things I've been working on today here at Elliott's is going through some of the film from when he was in the army in the 1940s uh, and it has that, that super spring to it, load it in the carrier and then just do a couple uh, recaptures and make sure that I have everything nice and crisp. That beautiful film grain. Okay, I'm just answering a question here in the chat. Um, so let's see. Somebody asked about tin types, amber types. Yeah, yeah. So, so with the um, with the photons, which are the lights on the on the you know on the hard sort of forty five degree angle arms, we can uh, we can capture we can capture any flat artwork. So tin types. Uh, I was doing actually a couple of old tin types uh, over the weekend for a client, um, and you know again it's it's all custom balanced and calibrated. It has a focus meter, so you're really looking at a, at a hundred percent. So being able to actually ensure that everything is in focus before we make a capture is, uh, is, is really important. And we're getting a lot of questions about the service and cost. And I think if you have really, if you have specific questions or would like a quote, uh, I think the best way to do that is to contact Scott, which is at Scott, S-C-O-T-T, -T, at digitalsilverimaging.com. And uh, or you can contact us uh, via the lab directly if you want to get Scott's phone number. Um, they'll give you Scott's phone number at the lab if you want to talk to him. So um, I'm, and I also want to say that uh, if you have any questions in general, um, you should give us a, you should send us an email. and We, we want to be a resource for you. So we'll try and get you an answer. Somebody asked about scanning with a flatbed scanner. And um, uh, if they, and I already put my email in response to that question, but uh, please contact us. So I'm gonna go on to another question. So it says glass or glassless holders. This is from Jerry Ginsburg. He says, um, file, he has questions. It says file formats. And he was a little unclear on what you meant by raw. And is there a difference between 16 bit TIFF and raw um, with, uh, larger chromes using 645 chromes and the, the the source that we're capturing whether it's 645 66 67 35 millimeter 4 by 5 8 by 10 um you know is we can we can do all of that we can capture all that the difference between raw and a tiff is a, is a raw is a in all the camera manufacturers nikon sony canon phase one uh have their own file format and it's the raw file format and it's it's the information and the data before the file becomes something. And so you have a tremendous amount of latitude. So the, the biggest difference in the, in the raw capture that we're getting here is that we're going to have 15, 15 and a half stops of latitude with that file before it becomes a TIFF and before you take it into Photoshop. So there's a, a credible amount of information captured. So we have a lot of, um, I want to say, flexibility to ensure you're getting the best image quality. Then once it's processed out, once you take that raw data and you process it out into a TIFF, a PSD, you know, a JPEG, a DNG, whatever format you prefer, you're putting that file within bookends in order to take it into Photoshop, um, Photoshop itself, not Adobe Camera Raw, but in order to take it into Photoshop, it has to exist within those bookends. And you have less latitude. Yeah, you can do a lot of retouching in Photoshop, but you have less latitude. And that's the beauty of the raw capture is that we have all of this information up front. We have a lot of latitude with the file. Then when, once we get a nice, beautiful file, we put it in those bookends, take it into Photoshop and do our final retouching. Yeah, and I also want to say that if you want, our, you know, because it's our system has real end-to-end -end flexibility. If you want, if you want both a, the raw file and the TIFF file and a JPEG, you know, it just that just is as simple as setting that up in our system, and you could get all three of those files, so you don't have to do that conversion work later. And Jerry also asked. Jerry asked a lot of questions, but they're really good, so I like Jerry. Um, he <laughs> asked um, shadow detail versus and he put tango so i think by tango he probably is referring to a drum scanner um, um again we, we're going back to that raw file so we have 15 and 15 15 and a half stops of latitude so incredible amount of shadow detail a lot of times uh shadow detail and and because of this is uh you know 3.6 microns or something like that um you know per pixel if you will those pixel walls are 3.6 microns uh, and so that's that's playing into shadow detail. Bear with me, because it's so small. Like the average human hair is 77 microns, so that puts that in perspective. You, you know, pluck a. I don't have any hair, but pluck a hair out and look at it and go, okay, that's 77 microns. This this file is being output at 3.6 microns, um, actually a little smaller, um, and that gives us line detail. There's a lot of information on lines, on edges, and stuff like that. 
And that also goes to play in shadow detail because one of the things with shadow detail is they tend to block up, right? Once you hit a certain point on your computer and on your digital file, it just goes, it just goes dark and it just goes muddy. The more resolution and the more latitude that you have in that file is the greater the ability of that file to be able to see the tonal range in the shadow. So the lights to the darks all the way, you know, all the way from zero to 256. Yeah, I just want to yeah. add too for Jerry, if you contact us, um, we will send you a comparison between uh, a drum scan of the same negative and uh, also captured on our system. So, um, and Bill asks about 16 millimeter movie film. And Bill, I'm just going to ask if you would contact us directly and give us some more specifics. Our system is capable of capturing movie film. Um, and But I think you need to talk to us a little bit more about that, uh, maybe in an email or uh, with a phone call. So I'm moving on here. Um, Beth asks, where are the locations where you can bring our negatives or in, in person? I'm located in Northern Delaware, just outside of Philly. So uh, maybe Scott, maybe you can address that question. So we have the Belmont location up there in, on the other side of Cambridge in Massachusetts, where the Digital Silver Imaging Lab is, uh, where we produce those absolutely beautiful prints, the True Silver Halley prints. Uh, the, the, as far as another physical location, that's gonna be the van. And that's what we're, we're ramping up. The van should be done by the end of this week. And we're gonna take this system and load it into the van. It's what we call our white glove service. So wherever you are in the United States, um, from, from Tucson to Delaware, uh, just give me a call and we can arrange where I'll come to your studio, I can come to you. With the van, there is a travel cost, uh, you know, associated, and we're just going off standard government rates at 57 cents a mile. Um, but of course, anything, it depends on the job, the size of the job, and we're happy to quote it out. Just, you know, get in touch with us and, and let us know the size of the job that you have and, and how we want to work. And, you know, yeah. we're, we're really, we are really willing to be flexible and work with you and I mean, that's the beauty of, of digital silver imaging versus, you know, a major institution is we have that flexibility. We have that desire to work with you as an artist and a creator and, and you know, figure out a solution that, that really works for you. So definitely just contact us. So we got a, we have had a couple of questions too about, oh, what is this, what does this system cost? And I'm just going to tell you that once you get it all put together, like we have our system put together, it's a six figure investment. So if you're ready to drop six figures and buy one for yourself at home, then uh, more power to you. So, um, and also people asked how much computing power does it take? And the answer to that question is a lot. <laughs> so uh, let's, I'm going to move on to some other questions. Um, I mean, in terms to answer that question, Andre, I'm not sure if, if the question is about on our side, how much computing power does it take or no, they were asking specifically how much the system costs. Oh, but in terms yeah, of not, own, not how much it costs to and I want to let me just throw this out there, Eric, I'm sorry to jump in again, but uh, people have asked uh, about pricing again. And so if we come to you or you have a, a particularly large job we want to be able to talk to you and quote that job because we want to fit our service to match your needs. But all our prices are up on our website. So if you go to our website and go under scanning, uh, it's all right there. I just posted it uh, the link in the chat uh, to our scanning page. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, yes, yes, these are, you know, if, if we output, output these as large TIFF files, yeah, you're certainly going to want you know, decent processing power to be kind of moving around and, and working with 300, 600, 800 megabyte tips. So if, that, if that's what the other question is. Um, somebody asked if we can, if we can photograph framed pieces. Uh, David, you asked that question and, and without having to take them out of frames. Uh, yes, we can. If there's a, if there's a tint, um, we can color correct that because we are using the, um, I think if you saw it in the video, we're using the um, cut the I'm sorry the X right digital color checker chart, so it's a, a much more expanded chart than the sort of standard gray tag and F chart. Um, and I don't know we don't have ours handy, do we? But it it, it you know it's a, it it really does do a great job on on doing that. Um, the stock can show it to you, but we we put that it's kind of like captured at the beginning of every of any session where we're doing flat artwork. We we you can do, yeah. So we digitize this and it kind of, it, it creates a, um, a custom calibration for each, every time we go in and, and, and shoot something. So we, we white balance to that, we set an exposure level and, uh, and that really helps us ensure that we're getting proper color. 
um, you know, if, if you have, uh, you know, if we we offer, I'm not sure if you saw it at the beginning of the video, but we do offer um, the ability also to send you a really good secure uh, vault shipping case made by Pelican. And we can, what we would do is we would send that to you with an empty uh, three ring binder, sealed binder. We can ship that to you. You can load it up, send it to us. We'll, we'll, we'll provide you with the prepaid mailing label. I think if you send uh, over 50 negatives, we'll actually pay the, the, the shipping back and forth. Um, and uh, uh, Amelie asked about a raw plugin for show that for Photoshop for the original system files. And I don't. The IIQ? Yeah. The Adobe Camera Raw will read the IIQ files. Um, Lightroom will, will read the, the original IIQ phase one files. That's, uh, I mean, that's the nature of technology. The biggest thing to keep in mind is if you're working with the raw files from, from phase one in particular, um, yes, Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw can read them, but they're not gonna give you the full information. They're not gonna give you all the data. Realistically, if you're working with the IIQs and you want the best results, you need to work through Capture One. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't take those files, load them into Lightroom, create quick JPEGs, you know, work on your database, you know, your your you know your Neo file with all of the thumbnails and stuff like that. If you're very very comfortable in Lightroom, you absolutely can do that. Uh, if you're comfortable in Capture One, uh, you'll you guys that use Capture One are going to know what I'm talking about um, and the power that it has as a raw conversion software because that's what it is at its core. Um, or, you know, when we deliver files, you just have us deliver high res tips, 16 bit tips. Uh, we're going to deliver a, a full, relatively flat file. We're not going to put it in either direction, but just give you a file with the most information possible. And we can also process JPEGs at the same time. So, if, you know, if you're, you want to go straight into a database and start building that database out with JPEGs, when we deliver the job, you just say, hey, I, I need tips and I need JPEGs. And we process it out that way and hand you the data back. Yeah. Um, so Marilyn asks, uh, Scott, if you scan 35 millimeter slides that have a color shift because they are old, do you automatically adjust to make them look more original? I, you know, yes. I mean, what we do is we try to take them back to, you know, how they should look. If there's a huge color cast on it, um, it'll be a conversation that we'll have straight up front. You know, as soon as I see the files, I'm going to, I'm going to capture one and then I'm going to make an adjustment that I think is appropriate on it get in contact with you, you can look at it. Because um, ultimately, if it if it was shot a certain way and you want it to look a certain way, it's not my job to judge that, right? It's not my job to go in and say, no, I, I think that's wrong. Because you as the artist, the creator, if it's old film and it's degraded over time, it's had color loss, um, that can definitely be corrected. We do a, a white balance. So we do a neutral tone correction to ensure that the white balance is correct and that the tones are correct. But as far as finite retouching, that is a service that we do offer. Um, you know, Photoshop work and, you know, the prices are on the website for that. Um, I also want to mention too that, um, that I think that we're kind of coming to the end of our time of the webinar. Um, so if you have any more questions, please post them in the Q&A. But I also want to mention that um, if you're interested in this service, please contact us. We also have additional materials we can send you. We have a white paper that we just finished and uh, we are going to post this webinar on our YouTube channel, along with uh, the video you just watched at the beginning, if you want to see it again. But uh, we're we're always happy to to talk to our to our people because photographers are our people. <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah. Um, and Emily, I'm assuming when you said is this a standalone program, Capture One is. Um, is is kind of like Lightroom, but uh, a little more powerful. It just doesn't have the sort of library functionality that um, that Lightroom has. So it is a great raw processing and editing software. Um, so it is a it, so the software is available just like Lightroom or Photoshop or or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it, it it's not going to replace Lightroom in terms of the library functionality. And your other question was how long do we keep the scans? And that that's another question that's kind of open. It's an open discussion. If you're going to want us to hold on to the scans because you want us to uh, be involved in printing and helping you with printing, um, then we have a locked down uh, client folder that is secure and we hold on files for our client, a lot of our clients that we do printing for. So um, we can certainly talk to you about backup and storage. Um, and, you know, I should mention that we're going to be having a, another webinar coming up here. Andrea, help me with the date with our friends from Drawbridge Digital. 
Oh, shoot. I want to say the 22nd of, I know uh, that's today. It's May. I, it's, it's somewhere, it's the 20th of May. So um, in terms of uh, an archiving and backup solution, we are working with a company uh, that we're very excited about uh, called Drawbridge Digital. And uh, they have some really amazing solutions for backup, storage, offsite storage, uh, and things like that. So be sure to, you know, if you're on our mail, if you're not on our mailing list, go to our website and sign up and we'll be sending out some more information about that upcoming webinar. Um, I'm trying to see if there's another, any other key questions. Um, what is the depth of field for capture? Um, say from the 35 millimeter. We are shooting at about F10, F11. Um, so, uh, you know, that does have, have some advantage over flatbed scanning. Um, but I'm not sure if that answers your question, Robert, um, on that. And um, to anybody else? And I want to also mention again that don't forget this system works beautifully with prints. And uh, working with Elliot, um, we actually captured a lot of prints for Elliot. Yep. Yep. Working on that. Working on some more of that this week, taking the master prints and archiving the master prints. The beauty of archiving a master print is it's already been touched in the dark room. It's already been, you know, given the love of the photographer to make it look the way that they want. Uh, so you just, you know, you get it in there, get a really clean capture of it, and it's easily reproducible. And that's, you know, that's where the system has value is oftentimes like, you know, Elliot is in the business of selling prints. He's in the, the business of selling images. And so being able to take something that he created on film and made this beautiful master print, uh, which, you know, Elliot's prints are incredibly valuable. They're very expensive, you know, if anybody wants to collect an autographed Elliot Irwin print, like, uh, you know, you're, you're going to pay well for it. Um, and being able to take that master print and then get it in a digital format so that it can then be reproduced later on down the road um, has, you know, value to the estate and to the legacy of, of Elliot, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. It's cool for me because I get to see them all. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And one more quick thing that I want to say that one of the things that we've actually come across that's a little tragic is that we have also come across film in people's archives that has basically uh, expired where the emulsion is separating from the base. Uh, so, you know, time is of the essence here, folks. So uh, if you haven't looked at those old negatives in a while, you should and, and give us a call. The absolute most archival thing that exists um, in our world today for photography is a print. Um, the, the prints are more archival than, than even the film itself. And people think, well, I have the film, I can always go back to it. But it depends on how it was fixed, depends on the, the chemistry, the, the temperature of the chemistry, the bath that it was put in. For my diehard film nerds out there, you guys know this. Um, if, it, if it was just a, a rapid batch or something you did earlier in your career and it wasn't super precise, that doesn't have longevity. It'll start to break down over time. So before we end here and we lose everybody, I also want to mention that tomorrow, since this is also, we want to thank Palm Springs Photo, who we have not thanked yet. So a big shout out to Palm Springs Photo Festival. And um, we also want to mention that uh, tomorrow we are going to be on, it's probably just going to be Eric because, you know, too many digital silver imaging people talking at once is just too confusing. Sure. So there's going to be a great panel discussion tomorrow. And if you go to the Palm Springs photo website, um, you can connect to that or go back to our email that we sent out. Um, you can connect to it that way. But it's a panel discussion at tomorrow. It's going to be at what time, Eric? Do you know what time that is? Uh, I, um, I, I'd have to check whether it's you know Pacific time because that's where Jeff Dunas is or, uh, or East Coast time. I want to say it's like eight in the evening um, East Coast time. Yeah, um, I, I think that's right. Eight Eastern. And five, it's yes, that's right. Eight Eastern, five Pacific, six Mountain, uh, seven Central. <laughs> and uh, that's going to be a panel discussion about the print with Dan Winters, Mona Kuhn, Eric Luden, uh, Jeff Dunas, uh, some, a noted uh, panel of archivists. It should be really terrific. That's an so, amazing panel. Yeah. 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 Honored to be on it. Great people. So, but we're we, again, we want to thank everybody for spending uh, the past hour with us. We hope we've answered questions. 
And obviously, for the ones that we didn't answer, uh, just to remind you again, Scott's email is scott at digitalsilverimaging.com. And you can also copy in our main uh, email address, which is just info at digitalsilverimaging.com. So, um, so again, whether you have a big archive, you know, obviously we're here at Elliott Studio and, and uh, you know, that's a, a massive archive, but if you have, you know, a smaller amount of images that you just want to get digitized, um, let us know. We can send you out our, our vault case. You can ship it to us safely that way. We'll return it to you safely and ensure that, uh, you know, you get your valuable images um, digitized and stored properly. So. I know it's scary, but we just did a job for a, a customer in Bethlehem. Um, and the, the images came all the way from Bethlehem to Boston. They got digitized and then the film went back. And, and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania? Bethlehem, yeah. Palestine. <laughs> yeah, Bethlehem, Palestine, yep. So not the steel capital. <laughs> yeah. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thanks again to our friends at uh, Palm Springs Photo for hosting this. Uh, looking forward to our joint event with uh, Drawbridge Digital and uh, certainly stay tuned for our other events coming up. And uh, thanks to Scott and for being flying in from Houston to help us finish up this archive. So um, looking forward to hearing from you uh, and working with you soon. Thank you, everybody. Super happy to be here. Yeah, uh, thank you. Palm Springs Photo Festival. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Enjoy your afternoon.